Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good evening. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, we have a team today to talk about the books. Uh, uh, oh, I oh, have books. I have books to I, talk about. <laughs> I have a lot of notes about my books because uh, I have around me there are a lot of books. So if you can be so kind, because we are broadcasting as always on LinkedIn and on Instagram. So if you can be uh, so kind, and put there that you can hear us. Uh, yeah, there, there is, you know, our Finnish guy positive reading session has begun. Good evening from Finland, my darlings. Good. That's right. Best, started... regards, best regards to Finland. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, when I, you I, finish on it, when it's dark in the middle of winter, you need something to do, right? Uh, exactly. So... To get warmer. To get warmer. <laughs> Absolutely. So I, I see a lot of people on LinkedIn. So if, if you can put in the comments that you can see us and hear us that would be great i'm uh, sure they'll be joining us and yeah. i have to say i have to say yeah the, the today's theme is a really hard topic for me because i grew up as the daughter of an english professor so reading was my <laughs> whole life it was my whole childhood whenever i said i'm bored they said great go read a book <laughs> so for me to pick out what are the ones that influence my life, what changed me, what really shaped who I am, I was like, how do I go through the million books I've read and pick the ones? So I think everyone here today is in for a treat because I did all the hard work of all the reading. And then I just will tell them what to read. Guys, can somebody from LinkedIn, because I can see you on my phone, okay, but... Uh... Uh, I cannot see it here. If you can put there just in the comments, there you can see us on the on the LinkedIn. That would be great. Maybe they're hiding. <laughs> I don't know because this, this is a, this is a, there are like thirty people there, but it's strange because they are not answering here. You know. Haha, -ha, we got it. Ah, we got it. Okay, perfect. Okay, Thomas. Yeah, it's working. Perfect. Okay, so let's start. Uh, I was asking Lisa, we are always getting to get like two minutes before the broadcast. Don't we're tell right. them our secrets. We Don't tell them. We, we, we prepare have, for hours. Yeah. We have a lot of great books for you, but obviously we would like to be very much interested in what are your, you know, favorite books also in the in the next part. Yura is there. Perfect. Okay. So, Lisa, why don't you start with your, you know, favorite book, and then I will add, and some of our, you know, colleagues on the online uh, will, will, you know, add. Yes. Well, Jan, this is a really loaded question. What's my favorite book? Because books have opened many different doors for me. So I actually, when I went through and I really thought about it, I said, okay, what were the books from my childhood that sort of really changed my life? Then I went through, what were my career books that really changed my life? What were the books I read that absolutely changed the way I think? Like I could never think about the world the same because right. I've read this book. So I have many different categories. Um, and I think I want to start with one that's very distinct for me and is probably not on anyone else's list. So I'm going to start there, which is a novel called To Kill a Mockingbird. Maybe you've heard about it. It's about, you know, the U.S. and in the South um, where there was slavery and lots of really tough racial, racial interactions. OK, so in the book, I won't I won't spoil it for anyone who wants to read it. But in the book, there is a man who is black who is on trial and nobody wants to be his lawyer. And this white man volunteers and they're having the trial. They're having the trial. And in the end. The reason that the black man gets convicted is because he says that he felt sorry for a white woman. And my teacher in the ninth grade, my English teacher said to me that sealed the coffin because in order to feel sorry for someone, it means your status and your position is elevated in some way that you are somehow in a better position. And at that time, with racial integration, it couldn't possibly be that a black person was in a better position. And I, it was the first time that I ever thought to myself, wow, power struggles really make a difference and can completely change the life of every person. And sympathy is maybe not something good. 
because sympathy actually separates us instead of keeping us at eye level. I didn't know I was going to become a coach when I was older, but I would say that is the starting point from when I started to really understand psychology and interactions and how to connect with people and how to be compassionate without feeling better than, without that white savior complex. So To Kill a Mockingbird, really great novel just to read in general, usually one of the top 100 books of the 20th century. I can recommend that. Probably not on most people's business reading book lists, but definitely worth it. Yeah, what about you? What's your favorite book? Probably the book which really changed, you know, my career just at the beginning was the book from Stephen Covey, uh, The Seven Habits of the Most Effective People, right? Uh, of highly effective people. Yeah, you've got it. Okay. <laughs> so uh, then I had, unfortunately, you know, as you know, Stephen Covey passed away a couple of years ago, but then I had the privilege to be taught by Stephen Covey because we, in Microsoft, there was a product called Office 95, and uh, there was a piece of this, you know, like seven habits uh, tool was part of that, you know, product, right? Why I like uh, this book because it was first book which went beyond classical time management, okay? Yeah. Because he, he talked about meaning in life. Uh, he introduced me, Viktor Frankl, who is very dear to my life, you, you, who, those people <laughs> who know me. It's like we did, guys, we did not rehearse, okay? We did not rehearse. <laughs> like Viktor Frankl, the man's search for meaning is a key to understand what is the meaning of your life or the other people's life and so on, right? Yeah. Because somehow uh, I coach today some finest athletes and, you know, top managers and artists and so on. And the thing is, if you have a meaning in your life and you are inspired, chances are you can get to the peak performance very often. You can get there, but you can stay there because it's you. It's your, you know, meaning, that activity, right? So I really, you know, love that book. And I, I know that book by heart, you know, right? And uh, it, 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 I read it first time when I was like 31 years old, which means like almost 30 years ago. And at, at that time, I was very much oriented. Like, it's all about the results. It's all about the numbers. That, that will, that's what matters, you know, everything else is irrelevant, okay? But then I read some book about meaning, about happiness, about fulfillment and inspiration, really. And that book, I think, changed me step by step, obviously, for, for the good. And I use it as kind of my, you know, one of my management Bibles, if you, if you will. So definitely, even though that book is like 35, 40 years old, probably, you know, I would recommend it to to you know read and i mentioned in in my book the positive leader which is like international bestseller i mentioned this book and some of the rules because i think it's really paying off in a very short you know way what what is the what is the nutshell of those seven you know habits okay he talks about you know number one be proactive go out of the comfort zone go out of your circle of you know in, in, uh, influence to the circle of your interest okay go there you know right that's number one the other thing is begging with the end in your mind begging in your vision what is the vision of your life okay the third is put the first thing first prioritize the things there are things more or less he's saying you should do things which are not urgent but important in your life because that's the way you perform the best and then you you're getting independent if you if you manage like be proactive beginning with the end in your mind and put the first thing first but obviously you want to be interdependent well, that's why humankind is so good right if we are you know in interdependent we are working you know together and so there are another four you know uh habits okay number four is win win think win win and I can tell you, whenever I was negotiating, whether it, whether I won and the other people, you know, lose or the other way around, it was not good. Even compromise is not good. You can always find a way, even though it's very, very hard, where you can win and they can win. I tell you what, uh, I was one of the negotiators during that, you know, uh, disagreement we've got in Microsoft with uh, European Commission. 
and we should get you know there, there was a danger that we should pay 11 billion euros fine at the end of the day it was really like win-win we paid two billion we invest a lot in europe and i became like advisor for higher education so you can really like step by step build a trust and and go there okay the the, the fifth habit is understand others before you try to be understood okay it's it's kind of the clear but at that time to be honest i i was not the best listener at all and i was like <laughs> so, i was good i was good in what i did but i was not great listener yes. but then but then because i'm not super empathic but then but i i i'm very curious and i like to learn so i said well you know what if i will shut up and listen more then i will even learn more <laughs> that's why i love this habit then the sixth habit it's about synergy and that's one i love very much and i strongly believe in that okay which means that you can get best in each and every person put people together so one person talents are covering the other person weaknesses and the other way around so there's a lot of you know synergy and this is it and last but not least is like sharpening the saw it's about four you know energies physical emotional mental and spiritual right so De definitely i uh, you know i can uh, recommend to you you know to read a book uh, first and then use those seven habits because this is really like it is about leadership it is about winning it's about you know meaning in your life it's about fulfillment you know fulfilling you know your heart if you will okay so anyway yes. so that, 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 that's, the, that's the one number one i i picked up yeah these two yeah and i can't tell you almost everybody is familiar with them most people say like oh yeah i i meant to read it it's sitting on my bookshelf i actually bought it i know my mentor told me to read it actually read these two books and if you read them 30 years ago some of you out there read them again right? Because these are sort of the absolute fundamentals to what you need. During this time with COVID and the great resignation and people sitting home and going, what is life all about? These have the answers to what is life all about and how do I make it work in business so that I'm happy and fulfilled, not just getting results. Yeah. The, guys, couple of advice, okay? It's great to read a lot of books, right? I, now I probably do more like YouTube, listening to YouTube speeches of those authors, and then, you know, I'm reading. But anyway, it's great to read. But if you want to be successful in whatever you do in your career and successful and, you know, happy, really a fulfilling life, it's also necessary to use some of the thoughts from those books in your day-to-day -day life. And if you will, like, read it and put it in your shelf, forget it, Okay. So what I recommend you to do, you know, what I do with each and every book, uh, you know, I'm like underlining, putting my own comments and so on. And then probably after, you know, a couple of months, I read those comments and whatever is underlined and so on. And like asking, did I use it somewhere? You know, stuff like that. It's really, this is the way, I, this is what I learned from Bill Gates, because I think Lisa wrote that he's reading 50 books, uh, you know, a year for sure, maybe even more, you know. Whenever I was traveling with Bill Gates, there was a bag of the, you know, uh, paper books <laughs> right at that time, you know. Probably right? got a Kindle by now, I don't but know. Now, <laughs> probably, but he likes, he likes still very much, you know, paper books, I think. Yes. Anyway, so use it, right? That That's 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 the point. Then, uh, yes. uh, if you wanted to get like sense of what's going on in the, in the books and then pick up the good books for you, uh, you may get, you know, on your phone, uh, Blinkist. Blinkist, uh, it's like the summary. Uh, there are like 10 points or 8 points about the book. It's like 15-minute summary about almost all books uh, there. So you can listen it, you can, you know, read it, and then you can, you know, buy the, the book if you, if you like it. But now, guys, mm -hmm. if you can put in the comments what kind of the book, just pick up, you know, one book, we change your life, you know, and why do you think it did so? 
Yeah, I'd love to hear that. And Jan, while while everyone's going to type that in, yeah. I'm going to give another little secret of sure. my own, sure. which is that I actually listen to ebook, uh, audio books yeah. while I'm jogging, while I'm ironing, you know, while I'm cooking, whatever it is, so that I can get through some of these. But at the same time as I'm listening, I order the print book and then I go through and I highlight and I add my notes so I can listen and get it done sort of faster. But I still have all the notes and all the reading and all the value of seeing it printed as well. And that helps for it to go faster. I save a bit of time, but I still have gotten through and have the, the right markings because like you, I go back and I reference them. I go, oh, I remember that story. Let me go find it, right? And they all have tabs and they have stuff written in. That's sort of the, the shortcut way to get there. I do, I do also audibles and podcasts. And I always, whenever I do some sport, I carry with me my recorder. And you can, you know, easily do like, you know, it's USB. You can put it in your computer and put the notes afterwards. So, I mean, everything, because very often we listen, we read, but the impact is very low. And unless, guys, let's put it in very clear unless you use what you learn almost immediately it will be gone very soon you know right it is about repetition it's about using i'm not saying that we should use all you know thoughts but at least some of the you know big thoughts from those books it's good you know to do it yes well while we're waiting so still put in those comments i think we have a little bit of a delay i yeah. can recommend this book called the artist's way now i am not an artist i'm not a painter i'm not a pottery and i thought the artist's way that's not really a book for me but actually it's a workbook so you have exercises one you do one every week for 12 weeks they have exercises in there. You have thought things you go through. You have things you have to put into practice in everyday life. You journal every morning. And so you can't really just read this book. You have to really do the book. And this is where transformation happens. Since I did this book, I've run three mastermind groups on it where I, you know, we meet every week and we talk through it and we, it changes people's lives. So if you're feeling uninspired in 2022, you're not quite sure, where do I want to go? What do I want to be when I grow up? Am I stuck in this career forever? You know, give this book a shot. Go through it. You don't have to actually be an artist. It's really just about finding your creativity. So uh, exactly. that was a big one that changed for me. Exactly. So th there are no... No books in the comments. Nobody line. reads in our audience. Uh, yeah, guys, you know, don't be shy. Put there some, you know, good books also for the others. Anyway, so I will uh, mention, you know, some other book, different, uh, you know, area. Okay, definitely the last year, one of the, I mean, I I, I knew Wim Hof before, but this his book Wim Hof Method it, it really helped me a lot. Who is, you know, Wim Hof? Wim Hof is called Iceman in Holland and everywhere else. And he basically invented, you know, method, like it's combination of cold water and uh, special breathing technique. And it's improving very significantly your immunity. Okay. Very significantly your immunity. So, and what it does basically it's putting your pH in your blood on the right, you know, level. And it's like fighting all infections, you know, right? So I can definitely, I do it like for two years already. Wim Hof Method, it's really good, you know, right? It, 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 is, it is very popular now among especially like athletes. Uh, but, and they, he works with like top university, it's, universities. It's really proven technique. Yeah, and I have to tell you, I really hate that guy because it works, but it means I have to take a really cold shower every morning. And every morning I hate it. And I think to myself, God, I wish this didn't work. And I wish I hadn't known about him from this book. But I do it and I always feel good after I've done it. So, of course, you know, you get addicted and you keep doing it again and again. But in the mornings, especially in winter, it is cold. <laughs> I do it, I do it like morning and evening. And it's really, and I combine it with that special, you know, breathing technique. The breathing technique in a nutshell is putting you artificially under the stress, you know, right? It's like, he, and it's the same with the cold water because if we are under the stress for a short time, 
if it's you know like acute uh, acute stress it's strengthening you right and and that's exactly what he's doing okay so uh let's put that david gruber uh onward from howard schultz i've not read this book yeah that's it that's a good uh, that's a good tip probably yeah absolutely, absolutely yeah david i'd love if you put in the comments here what did you love about this book because i would love to know more about it whether it's worth yeah. adding i have a 2022 reading list and it you know it's not completely full yet so i would love to add that in well, there is a Finnish friend. Uh, here we go. Wim Hof. I've been waiting for this moment. This morning comment about my recommendation. So we had a little chat on LinkedIn as we okay. felt so, so right. kind to post about our events. And he was saying, you know, here are the books that I would recommend. And Wim Hof was there. And I said, you're going to have to wait until tonight to find out if it made it on our lists, right? We have to keep some suspense going. So now here we go. One of those books, check. They showed yeah, up tonight. Absolutely. <laughs> so Yurai is here. Jordan Belfort books, one of my famous books from him, Way of the Wolf. I start to understand more psychology of self. The Wolf of Wall Street, right? <laughs> Everybody who wants to sell should, you know, watch the movie, the, that kind of the movie or, you Tell know. Tell me this people. pen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, because, you know, yeah, a lot of people think that selling is kind of the very special, whatever, but uh, yeah, you, you need to learn it. It's a, it is a skill, you know, right? And I think almost everybody can learn it. I think so too. I think it all comes down to psychology. And that's what I loved about Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It was one of the first books that made everyone say, it's not results, it's not facts, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're not talking just economics, we're talking behavioral economics, we're talking humans. And while we're talking about behavior and people who don't really make a whole lot of sense, how does the brain work? Why do we make these decisions that are completely irrational? We should be rational decision-making things, and yet we're not. Why is that? And so Danny Kahneman goes through in this book, which really changed how I understood the brain and how people think. What are our biases? Why do we, why does, why do so many people make so many irrational choices, right? To this day, I had a client saying to me, oh, I, I just realized I had the sunk cost fallacy. We were working on a project. We've done a lot, but it's actually really hard. It's really time consuming. It's costing more and more money. We have so many projects, but I didn't want to let it go because I just felt we'd already done so much work. And I just, we have to let it go. It's at this point, it's irrational for us to continue, but our mind, our emotions tells us to just keep going. So we got to make sure when you read this book, figure out which biases are showing up in your life, in your team's lives. How does your brain think and how do you work with your brain to notice, ah, that's my brain trying to trick me because when you're aware of it, you can override it. No, you guys, and you should understand. Daniel Kahneman is a Nobel Prize laureate. You know, is a you know Nobel Prize winner. Uh, well, you know, red uh, uh, guy. And I think the things, the stuff in that book should be taught in each and every school, almost. You yes. know, right? Like, a, because we are t still, we are everybody's like in, in the sport. I tell you what, what is happening in the sport? Even like top top guys, okay. Everybody talks, it's all about the brain. It's all about your head. It's all about your mental, you know, right? But nobody is doing that. We are teaching, you know, kids, maybe psychology when they are, you know, at the university, some basic stuff. But we can learn this, you know, uh, slow, fast uh, thinking. I mean, on the on the level of the kids, we can, you know, uh, we, we can teach very soon. I We did with my counterpart, Katarina, like 8,000 kids already trained in, in unlocking potential course. And kids are like for seven years old, you can explain basic things like stress, yeah, how amygdala works. We call it, you know, small monkey, stuff like that, you know, right? That's absolutely possible. So Edward, our friend Edward from Switzerland, emotional focus therapy, coaching client to work through their feelings from Leslie Greenberg. Yeah, absolutely. This one, I don't know. 
So you see, we're getting really great tips. There's lots of things to work on, lots of books about emotions, emotional intelligence, um, and understanding how emotions work. Again, we're all humans. If you understand emotions and you understand psychology, you can do anything. You can do sales. You can do marketing. You can run a successful business. You can anything if you understand emotions and psychology. That yeah, my, oh, go ahead. There, there, there is a, another great author around emotions, and Lisa know her. It is. I'm looking uh, for her book. She's Lisa here somewhere. Fel, Lisa Feldman, basically. <laughs> Lisa Feldman talks about emotional variability. That we have many, you know, emotions. And in fact, uh, in, in school, we are taught that emotions are somehow captured in our brain. Emotions are created, okay? Emotions are, it's nothing, you know, fixed. Interesting enough, I've got, you know, now a couple of athletes today, and I talk to them about the fact that whatever is in the score is in the score. You cannot change the score. Score is the past. What you, you can change is your mental score because that's what will happen from now on, okay? And that, you know, chemical cocktail, whether, whether you will have there, you know, endorphins, dopamine, the good stuff, or, you know, uh, cortisol or adrenaline, that all depends on the way you think and how you manage your emotions. Because emotions are having... Emotion is your thoughts touching your body more or less you know right this is it you know yes okay. and yeah one of the books that changed my life so i told you there are some books that literally changed the way i could i could never unsee them in the world is the book emotional agility by susan david now i don't have it on my bookshelf because i lent it to someone and i don't know who so i don't i never got it back um, but emotional agility, because the, exactly what she said is so perfectly summarized. We don't ignore our emotions because if you ignore them, they still sit here. They don't go anywhere. We also don't let them run the show, right? What we do is we notice them. We show up with curiosity, right? And then we can work with them and use them as data points and information and help us to figure out what it is we want to do and where we want to go. This was the first time that I realized, oh, I'm supposed to work with emotions. I'm not supposed to try to contain them or wash them away or try to get rid of them in any way. I want them. I want to know what I'm feeling. I want to understand what it is because the more that I can understand them, the better that I can make decisions. That leads to my best 2022 recommendation, Brene Brown's new book, Atlas of the Heart. I so didn't know that book. Oh this, oh, this is a fantastic book. And the reason is, it's kind of an odd name for a book. I think it might be yeah. off-putting. But the, in the book, what she does is she takes all these different feelings that we have. What are the emotions that we have when things aren't, when we're going through hurt? And then she says anguish, hopelessness, despair, sadness, grief. And so she helps to give us, oh, I kind of know what. Can you show the book again? Because you, you show it for a short time. Okay. Brand Renee Brown, Brown, Atlas, Atlas of, of the, the Heart. Heart. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about it is, for example, sometimes I'm sitting with a client and they say, okay, uh, I, I, I messed up. I made a mistake. I failed. And I said, okay, in this book, places to go when we fall short, shame, but also we could have self-compassion. We could find perfectionism. We could have guilt. We could have embarrassment. We could have humiliation. What's the difference between all of them? Why do we feel what they are? How do we move past them? This is your reference book for emotions. Perfect. So for people learning in 2022, I'm going to navigate that. I'm going to learn how to do it. I'm going to be curious and actually work with emotions rather than ignoring them and letting them run the show from behind the scenes. Those are the two books I would recommend. There is a finish run. I have two questions. Firstly, what does Jan think about the yellow book we can see? Now? I've been waiting. Oh, yeah. Secondly, I've been waiting. when you make your own book, Lisa. Positive I, leader. I, Come I, on. Number one. I feel, I feel very good about the positive leader. Uh, sales is going still very well, but it I mean, sales is sales, right? I mean, it is rather about, you know, feedback I'm getting. And some universities pick up the book. In fact, I'm teaching tomorrow and on Saturday course on positive leadership at the Luxembourg Business University. Uh, that's the, I, I teach it like third year already. 
So it's going very well. And, and obviously, I put there a lot of my own experience about the leadership. Uh, but because I, I uh, wrote it with Melina Costi, and she is like teaching at the university. So there is also frame, kind of the academic framework, if you will. So it's possible to teach according to that book. Okay. And, uh, and recently I learned that there is a, a faculty, there is a, at the Charles University, there's a faculty of theology. They are like, you know, the, 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 they are like teaching the priests yeah. and they are teaching leadership according to the book Positive Leader, which I really appreciate. And oh, I was invited, I was invited to speak there. Yeah. So Lisa, your book, your own book. <laughs> All right. I'm, I have to admit this to you guys. I mean, now I'm admitting it live, but I'm just going to go for it. I've always wanted to write a book. I'm terrible at sitting down and actually writing, but I did start sketching out a book on ultra high performance. How do we get people to that really, you know, we have top performers and then we have those elite, elite performers and what makes the difference? And I'm going to, so I started outlining it. I don't know if I'll ever have the I don't know, capability to write a whole book. Jan, I mean, kudos to you. That is a really, really hard endeavor. But I'm going to give you all a little secret into what would show up in my book if I if and when I write it, which is it's actually all about creativity. Hmm. And what does that mean? And when you look at Nobel Prize winners, when you look at you know scientists who made these big discoveries, the way that they did that is they had like hobbies on the side or different experiences and they could open their minds in such a creative, curious way that they could then go back and look at their work in a completely different way. And they're doing research now about, you know, why do most people have maybe one sort of really good creative burst in their career? How do we make that not just once? How do we make that two, three, four, five? How do we make that yeah. continuously happen where you have a breakthrough and then you have a breakthrough and then you have a breakthrough, right? Much like Amazon. And they're starting to figure out the science of it, which is you go out and you look for inspiration. You look for creativity. You look for new inspiration in crazy places. But so you do the exploration but then you have to figure out how to bring it back together so that you can actually use it for your work. So many people do one, exploring is fun, and then I go to work, or they say I'm focused on the results and I do my work, but not enough people are figuring out how to explore and bring that back to their work. And that's why I have, I don't know, a million books on creativity that I would love to share here. Adam Grant, Originals, How to Be an Original Thinker. Um, David Epstein, Range. This is one not a lot of people know about, but I can highly great. recommend it. It's great, yeah. Because in this book, you know this then, Jan, because he talks about, okay, for example, Roger Federer, fantastic Swiss tennis player. He did not start playing tennis. He started playing many different sports. He didn't specialize early on. And because he didn't specialize early on, he was able to have tricks from the different sports that he played. And he was able to be better because he was a generalist first. And so figuring out in your career, in your hobbies, not just specializing in one thing, but how to go out and test lots of different things and have a wiggle waggle career and how in the end that gives you something so unique so creative in what you can bring that you get farther and in the end than anyone else who just keeps a specialized path so keep this in mind if you're curious and looking to explore in 2022 yeah the david epstein book talks about the fact basically that you know this generalization that you can take as many as experiences as possible and then you really like what you said you really concentrate you do you do first kind of the zoom out like you go like that you explore and then you really concentrate okay the problem with education is that we are teaching people in the boxes and we are not connecting the boxes i'm very often getting feedback like jan you know so much guys i know a lot but what, when I'm really good, I can use my knowledge from one box to several different boxes. That I tell you what, when I started to work with athletes, I have a lot of coaches saying, 
you are a great manager, no doubt, but you will not be able, you know, to use it with athletes, whatever. I, I was like 100% sure this is it. I will, you know, right? And uh, I think the, the, the history showed it, you know, right? Yes. Uh, so this is it. You can, you, you can think like, hey, how can I use, for example, I, I, I give you one example, okay? How can I use what we did with the teams in Microsoft? And I got like four people and many thousand people. How can I use it when I coach, you know, a captain for the uh, one of the best ice hockey team in Czech Republic or the basketball, you know, captain, you know, uh, right? How can I, you know, use my knowledge in there? And it's a very similar. You need to create synergy. You need to inspire people. You need to be CEO, Absolutely. chief enthusiasm officer. You know, <laughs> this is it. So Absolutely. There is, another, there is another one from Edward. Not a book, but a movie, film. To understand the emotions, the movie inside out with the main yeah. absolute, absolute access, <laughs> joy, sadness, anger, fear, and disgust is a mind breaker that makes a lot of things understandable. Emotions are key to understand the world. Edward is spot on because yeah. I can tell you, I was sitting at the board meetings of the different large organizations. I was working with many, many governments, mainly in Europe. And I can tell you, after all of that, I would say that, you know, decisions are maybe made half on the logic, but 50%, at least 50% on emotions. In some governments, if you go to the south of Europe, it's probably 80% of emotions. <laughs> but I, this, is, this is spot on, you know, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, here's the thing. I mean, so much of our minds, I, I have to like say, the more I learn about how our brains the work, the, the, the more scared I am. I feel like, oh my gosh, we have almost no free will because so much is almost like processed and put in and done and habits. And we don't even know when our emotions are actually causing our thoughts. Because if you walk into a house, let's say you're buying a new house, you walk into it, you love it. All of a sudden, the rational part of your brain is going to start to think about rational reasons why you love it. Exactly. But actually, the emotion is what made the decision. So for people who say, yeah, but I made it rationally because of these three reasons, no, you didn't. And so you really have to start to understand emotions to know, am I being tricked by my emotions right now? There's this amazing book. I mean, you don't have to read it. I just thought it was really good. Um I can't remember the exact title right now, but it's about con artists. And uh, she said, this woman studies con artists throughout time. The confidence game is what it's called. And, um, and, and in one of the interviews, someone asked her, do you think you would be con? Do you know what to look for? You know exactly how they do it. And she was like, yeah, absolutely. I would still be conned. Absolutely. Because the human brain works the way it works. And these people have figured out what are the exploitations of what's going to convince the brain to feel safe. And they know how to do it. And even if I'm on guard, I can't resist almost because the brain wants what it wants. Um, so really interesting to know emotions because they are running the show, whether you want them to or not. <laughs> I did that. There is a message for Dark Meeker uh, because he or she needs to go. Your English is fine, absolutely fine. Don't worry. It's great. <laughs> they say they need to go, and it's no English. Is not <laughs> well, guys, talking. Uh, I follow a bit on you know emotions, okay, and and also a bit you know about our you know thinking and what Lisa said about ultra performance. There is a great book from P Professor Carol Dweck, Mindset. Okay, yes. definitely recommend you that book. And it, it talks about two mindset, fixed mindset, which I think it's pretty much taught in majority of the schools because we Absolutely. are like we are demonizing mistakes. We are saying this is it. This is the, this is the only way you can do it. Right. And that's how the fixed mindset is created. And once people with this fixed mindset are doing some mistakes, they are like afraid they don't want to try again. They are very soon giving up. On the other hand, uh, growth mindset is really about like looking at the you know options at the, at, the, at the possibilities, right? She's saying that you know fixed mindset people seeking approval, uh, those with a growth mindset seek development. Okay, Bill Gates was always telling us he was definitely you know growth mindset. He was telling us if you don't know whether you should do it or not do it, you can always ask for forgiveness. You know that's what the growth mindset people are doing. You know. 
if they screw something, hey, you know, we move on. You, you learn from that experience, okay? Uh, the, it, you know, get, fix mindset, see fa possible failures or failures. Why? For the growth mindset is, hey, it's a learning opportunity, you know, right? I, I learn, you know, something new. And so th there's a one trick. I mean, I would recommend you how to build a growth mindset. Like every day, try to, you know, remind yourself what was going well during the day what I call repair, you know, which means I learn from what was not going very well. You made some mistakes, you know, right? And we learn very well because your brain will generate like the peak of uh, neuroadrenaline and you are, you are like, hey, this is really important. You know, I need to I need to remember that, right? And then, you know, imagine how you will do it in the future. And this is the way, you know, uh, dopamine will be released in your brain. You will be like awarded for that what you did that day, but you will have also energy. Uh, you will have also energy to continue. I think for for the for the great peak performance or even ultra performance, the growth mindset is absolutely necessary, right? Because it's everything about. I mean, look, you have in your life you have some expectations, and your reality is not there. The growth mindset is trying to put you know go step by step. And put your reality very close to the expectation, and then maybe higher expectation. The fixed mindset, if if the fixed mindset people are not, you know, successful, they go and they are putting their goals, you know, down, right? And that, and I and I think that's the that's the problem. And they maybe achieve the goals, but they are still not, you know, very happy because they can say, hey, I should not be like national winner, but I should be like Olympic games winner, right? This is it. So yeah, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a book to explain exactly what's happening. Now, people, this is a little bit of a hard book to read. So if you're not really into the science, you can skip it and just listen to my summary of it. But here's what happens, Jan. It sounds so easy. Which means, stop, stop. Which means you are telling us that we don't have scientific minds that you you have I don't have, no no I didn't have a scientific mind I felt it very hard to get through that's no, why okay, I'm right. helping I'm, I'm us, misery scientific minds give us to, to normal people to people who are really like <laughs> I don't know I don't have a science mind I'm the creative no go but, go go so, <laughs> in this in this book here's what it was like. so I what I was going to tell you is in growth mindset it sounds so easy everyone who's here today says yeah great sounds good growth mindset got it why don't most people actually have growth mindset or what holds us back from having a growth mindset all the time and this book changed the way that I understand how we interact with people and the reason is he argues we need to have this connection with others. We need this sense of belonging, not because it's nice or we feel good, because it's a human need that's as fundamental as food, water, shelter. It's biologically built, wired into our brains that we need to belong. Now, what happens if you take a risk? Oh, I'm going to take a risk and then I'll just learn if I fail. <gasps> but I might not be long. Fear sets in. And I never really understood why people are so afraid to take risks until I understood this. They are so afraid to not be accepted and not feel they can belong. And understanding how to find your people where you fit in, where you can belong so that you can take a risk and someone still loves you at the end of the day, that's the key to actually implementing growth mindset versus loving the idea and then doing nothing about it in your real life. So in this book, they say, all you need to know, just as immediate of a need as water is for your body, so is belonging with other humans. No, it's absolutely true. And it's connected with, you know, FOPO, right? Fear of other people's opinion. Because if you are like belonging, and then you are refused, you think, hey, I'm dying because in the past you would die, right? You would not have any, you know, food, right? And that, 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 that's, the, that's the problem, for example, with the COVID that some people are not, you know, with the, uh, with the other people. And I, but I, you know, what I, what I see, Lisa, with this, you know, belonging, right? Especially with the social networks that uh, society is very much polarized today, right? Yes. Over like in, in your, like in your home country, Trump, non-Trump, you know, now, 
uh, anti-vaxxers, vaxxers, you know, right? And I'm like, you know what? I'm like vaccinating everything, but I'm not pushing anybody. Everybody should behave responsibly, in my view, okay? This is, it should start with me, hey, I don't want to, to take a place in the hospital. That's why I'm get, doing a lot of exercise, Vim or whatever. And I, I got vaccinated because I, I asked somebody who I believe is the right, you know, professional to tell yes. me what is the danger, whatever. And I got vaccinated, but I'm not pushing anybody, right? It, it, yeah. This is it. And both both group like knocking the door and saying, are you in like, are you for vaccine or against? No, I'm like for the health, you know, right? So exactly. <laughs> Right. So I don't need to be like I'm 60 and I have my own opinion. So I don't need to belong to that group or that group. You know? anyway. Yes. But Jan, here's what's so interesting. Beyond just what in the heck is going on with society right now, right, right. most of the ultra high achievers that I coach, that we coach, I'm sure you experience the same. Actually, fundamentally, again, they want to belong. But for some reason, they felt that they couldn't belong at eye level. And so they felt early on, maybe their parents said, I'm going to give you praise and recognize you for your achievements, right? I'm going to push you. Your teacher said you got good grades. I have to be better than everyone else. Competitors, right? Sounds, sounds right, like a, like a sports person. And their way of belonging is by being distant and being above. And that is also a lonely place to be. I have to work with a lot of ultra high achievers to say, you don't have to be here. I know it feels scary. People are going to love you when you're here and it's going to be okay. And actually that's the thing. Once they figure that out, that really unlocks their ability to be themselves and to bring out their creativity, to take their risks that they need in their career, to have that crazy idea, to launch that crazy product. And isn't it weird that in business, to get people to be more creative in business, I have to tell them, just do some belonging work, right? But this is why we go back and we say emotions and psychology are what's going to create business results. It's not about the business results themselves. It's about the people. No, Lisa, as you said, one important thing about like being, you know, on the on the on the peak of some organization or some, you know, group or whatever. It's it's yeah, not right. for everybody. I was there for, you know, many, many years, and it's a very lonely job, you know. So very lonely. lonely job. Because you don't have I mean, people will will, you know, uh, give you some hints and some advices and you have some boss. But at the end of the day, you need to decide on your you know, own. And sometimes those decisions are really, it's not that, if it's about the money, it's relatively easy, okay? But uh, it, it's usually about like the future of the people and so on. So uh, the, the, everybody who wants to be like leader and manager should think twice, hey, am I, you know, ready to have this, you know, lonely job? And it, I mean, it's not that you travel with the other people, that's fine. But at the end of the day, you need to make some tough calls, some tough decisions, you know, right? Yeah. yeah, and I had a coaching call with a client today. We check in for 10, 15 minutes twice a week simply because there's literally nobody else that she can talk to to sort of just offload what's going on. What am I feeling? How do I process this? She says she's an out loud processor or like, you know, and she, you can't complain to your boss, right? You don't want to look bad. You can't complain to your peers. You certainly can't complain to your direct reports. Your spouse doesn't get it. Absolutely. It's very lonely. Who takes off the pressure? So uh, executive coaches help with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, interesting point from Mika. There are two major things missing in the society. Attitude to discuss about different opinions and common sense. I absolutely agree. And I, yeah, and I... There's a book up here. Okay. <laughs> I think that unfortunately social networks are not, you know, helping because social networks are not based on agreement and synergy. They are based on disagreement, okay? So you should understand those algorithms. It's like whatever is the big thing, you know, right? Big issue, people disagree. Uh, there's a high, you know, followership, right? I could, I could get, I have like... Uh, on all social networks, like 100, 
40,000 people following me, but I could have half million if I would put there, what do you think about the vaccine, you know? What do you think about Djokovic, you know, right? Should he go? Should he? But I'm not like, I try to put people, you know, together, but I absolutely agree uh, okay. with, with, with you, Mika, because I mentioned Djokovic, right? I think all parts make some mistakes. I, Australian government, they didn't give him enough, you know, time to respond. They gave him visa, then they withdraw it. Djokovic, you know, he was like, you know, uh, with the, with, with, it was with COVID, but he was like outside, whatever, you know, right? So uh, uh, there were a lot of mistakes done there. Uh, and I think they should make some agreement. Hey, this is it. Let's move on. I think if, if he would not be allowed to come back like for three years, it makes no sense to me. But, you know, there were some mistakes done. Like, but again, you have like people against him and then people for him. I mean, I know that in Australia, that was really, really bad. People could not move for one year. But it has nothing to do with Djokovic. Djokovic case is separate from this one, right? Djokovic Emotions. Case, it is absolutely. It is. It is the right. It is the right of Australian government to expel Djokovic. Absolutely. But it has nothing to do with the fact that people could not move for one year there. You know, right? That uh, this is it, right? So I, I anyway, it, it's gone. So hopefully, you know, it, it will survive. But it's a pity. Uh, for all reasons, you know, right? So, yes. and, the, and, the, and the common sense, this is it, you know, people promote real disagreement today, then like, hey, let's go step by step. Because look, if me and Lisa, we would strongly disagree with each other, we would build our agreement like, hey, let's look whether there is some common denominator, whether there is something small we can agree and from there, we would, you know, move, right? That's that's kind of normal way in the business, how you how you get to the, you know, agreement or at least some, you know, reasonable reasonable deal. But unfortunately, this is not today. I mean, it's like people are really opinionated. This is good. This is bad, you know, wrong, good. It's, it's, yes. and it's even in the sport. In the sport, if you look, look, watch some people like following, you know, Ronaldo or whoever. In one week, he is a hero. Next week, when he's missing the penalty, oh, that's so bad. You should go back to the school, whatever. <laughs> I mean, here's the thing, right? High emotions sell. We need, we have so many that's things true. going on. What's going to grab our attention? Really strong emotions, really crazy things. Yeah. Social media is actually absolutely building that up what i was trying to point to up here is adam grant has a book recently called think again and it's how to basically you think something instead of looking for more evidence that just supports exactly what you already thought you see vaccines are bad because i saw this and this and this and this friend said this and a colleague had it and it was fine and this and but you're blind to seeing what's really happening and both sides on any side, right? In any situation, this is how our brains are. And so we have to actually learn how to hold on, slow down, get rid of these cognitive biases. How do we learn how to think? How do we take the time to slow down our fast brain and really understand? And that's where new common sense gets built. It's not what worked four years ago. Two years ago, if someone said there's going to be a worldwide pandemic, you'd be like, yeah, right. But we have to rethink. We have to think again. We have to learn. And so sometimes we have to unlearn what we know and then be open to hearing and understanding what might be a new piece of information. And I think that is what's missing. People are not open to new information that could have them change their opinion or be open to seeing both sides and that's where everything is declining but the uh, reason for that it's really school because school is teaching you this is the only one version of the truth school is killing curiosity if you are curious okay you may think maybe i'm wrong you know maybe there is something you know new right the stuff i teach today it's probably 30 percent difference different from like three years ago because you know uh neuro uh science you know there are new things in neuroscience so you learn a lot and i think if if ever uh, imagine the world where everybody would know 
that your monkey, your emotional part of the brain, amygdala, is five to ten times faster than your logical part of the brain. Exactly. And you would watch the TV, and there would be very negative news. Who would say, "Oh, they are pushing," you know, my monkey. They are pushing me to watch it. And you will switch it probably to the Big Bang Theory or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> my husband's favorite show, by the way. Or, or something scientific, whatever you know, right? But we are like everybody is stuck with uh, you know negativity, and this is it, right? It is about it because if you look even like Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, those are the media 15 years ago. I really read because it was full of the facts today. It's like it, you, you have the facts there, but it's around like all, you know, scandals, stories, negativity and so on. You know, right? They have to sell. So right. young, I, I have two books. That Let's I go. still I need I can't let tonight go by go. without Let's explaining. Go. I have I have still uh, for the next time. Yeah, let go. Okay. Let's go. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe we'll do a part two. Yeah. Nonviolent communication. I hate the name. I have literally been changed in how I talk to people, how I listen to people, how I see people, how I hear people, how I negotiate with people, how I sell to people. Everything about how I interact with people changed from nonviolent communication. If you listen to the audio book, it's read by the author and he has like a very unique voice. So it's also sort of fun to hear it, but I use it as a reference Bible. I do exercises. I do training programs on nonviolent communication. I don't love the name. It sounds violent, but he does actually go in. He works with gangs. He works with, you know, warring tribes, but he also works with couples and businesses yeah. and right. It works for everyone. And basically you will go back to understanding what's the need that's happening behind what they're saying and really understanding your need. Because most of the time we don't even know what it is. We know we're angry and we're saying something, but we don't really know the need. And we don't really understand the need that the other person has. And when you can get to the need, I have a need for security. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm, you know, yelling about needing to do a good job at work because I'm afraid I'm going to get fired because I have a need for security. Knowing this, and this is definitely one you have to practice. You will not just read the book yeah. and know how to do it, right? If you can master nonviolent communication, sold. Your life is forever changed. And by the way, at Microsoft, uh, uh, the CEO all, also says he made gotcha. all of the senior, yeah, he made all of the senior team read this book and they practice it because it is life changing to your communication. By, by the way, it was always in Microsoft when CEO, whether it was Bale or after that, Steve Jobs read some good book. Everybody in the leadership team got the book and we read it, which is good. I think it is good. It is true what Lisa is saying. Whatever you are saying, you know, and other people listen, it creates chemical cocktail in their brains. And it can be good cocktail, you know, or bad cocktail, right? So this is it. The, the words are really creating, you know, perceptions and the words are in the long run creating the future. Yes. There's so much like to unpack here about how we can connect. We talked about how do I feel belonging? How do I let go of the anger so that I can be vulnerable with someone else, even a partner, a spouse, a friend, a sister. And it's about feeling heard and seen and understood. Yeah. And this book helps you to articulate what you need to feel heard, seen and understood and to see other people. And it is amazing when people feel seen and heard, they are loyal to you. If you're a leader and your team feels, wow, she gets me, he gets me, they are there, ride or die. This book will change your life. And the last book? <laughs> A journal. I happen to be using this one at the moment. I, I do some consulting for a company called Kintsuki, Shape Your Habits. My morning pages. Don't, I don't want anyone to read my personal journal here. But this is the journey to self-awareness. So it's, a, it's not really a book so much as it's the book you are going to write.
not about a topic. You don't have to be an expert, but every day I sit in the morning for 30 minutes and I just go through what's the stuff that's swirling in my head. What do I need to make sense of? Where do I need to focus? Where, you know, what are my aspirations? What are my dreams? Who am I mad at? What's going on? How do I connect these 14 books and connect the dots and come up with a new idea? Where do I want my business to go? It all goes here and with self-awareness and with clear thinking and with time to reflect and connect the dots, it's the best learning you'll ever do. Yeah. So I recommend everybody has a journal. I, I think I would go like one level above. I think it's great to have a reflection like every day in the evening, yes. in the morning, doesn't matter what I do. I don't have like journal, journal, but I do probably three to five, six, sometimes 10 speeches a week. Okay, different speeches. So whatever I learn new, I'm putting it immediately in kind of my, you know, comments and, uh, you know, try to update my slides and so on, you know, right? Uh, to use it immediately, because that's another that's another thing. It you, you can learn so many things, but if you will just learn it theoretically, it's not, you know, helping. You need to use it, okay? And put the stuff together because that's how synapses are how synapses are connected. More you will use it, you will have a stronger synaptical connections in your brain, and it, it will get you know better and better, and you will get better and better. And even if you were like coaching or leading people, uh, doesn't matter, right? But you know uh, this is it, uh, right? So uh, really, reflection uh, is very good because you can like slow down and say, hey. This is, and you can use this frame, you know, what what was going well, you know, remind what was going well, repair what was not going well, and imagine how you will do it for the future. You can, you know, also put down what you, what you, what you learn, right? You can even do sometimes, if I'm really meeting somebody very interesting, I'm already putting a couple of points, what can I learn, and what kind of the questions I can ask that person to learn a lot of, you know, more. I was always like whenever I was traveling with Gates, I've got always a couple of papers, like not not what he said about business or whatever. That was okay, but you know, not, nothing surprising. But how he behaved, what he did, you know, how he was reading stuff, how he was coaching me, stuff like that, really, you know, right? Yes. Perfect. That's it. I got through my, uh, I mean, I have a million more, but this me was, too. I think, the highlights. Me yeah, and anything else still. you need to add? Oh. We or still, do we do part two? We, do, yeah. we, will do, we will do part two, absolutely. So, Good. Uh, guys, thank you very, very much, uh, you know, for uh, your attention and for the, for uh, being with us. Uh, yeah. We will have another team in two weeks from now. This is like regular now. You know, we go for almost one year. And, yeah, and... Uh, have a have a nice evening and uh, and again to those of you who are here for the first time this year all the best in 2022 all health and happiness and success yes. yeah yes make 2020 you are 2022 our best year so if you have a topic you want to hear just put it in the comments below exactly. and we'll be happy yeah. to address it next time okay all right everyone take care bye bye bye